So, hey, and welcome back to our live stream session today. Uh, next up, we're looking at the Fiat Cup project, uh, which is also in uh, relationship with the Linux boot project. And let's dive right into it. So what is Fiatka? It's a graphical firmware editor and analysis tool. So here we present you the uh, Fiatka website uh, where you can download uh, releases from right here, or you can also just look at the code repositories and now there is a brief description of what the project is actually about. So in firmware images, including that of your laptop, for example, and also server systems and so on, there is a lot of data and files in there. And around that, there is file systems. So if you have heard of like UFI, for example, or Core Boot, or the Intel Management Engine, or AMD, uh, they have something called the Platform Security Processor. All of those actually define file systems. And in Fiatka, we can visualize those file systems. So in the Linux Boot project, uh, we have another project, sorry, uh, which is called Fiano. That's what we just looked at in the previous stream. And now I want to uh, give you some example of what it actually looks like when you're working with that. So yeah, um, here on the website, it's just on fiatka.app. That is F-I-E-D-K-A dot app. It's actually a Russian name. So Fiatka written like this year uh, in Russian Cyrillic. Um, but yeah, this year is like a transliteration. <laughs> uh, on the website, you can see the file systems already supported. So yeah, as you can see here, uh, so far we have UFI, the flash file system in UFI, or a firmware file system. I don't know what FFS was short for. Uh, in Core Boot, we have the Core Boot file system. We can already read that or, well, analyze it. Uh, we have a parser for the AMD PSP file system. Well, it's now called ASP instead of PSP. That's for AMD Secure Processor, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and for the Intel Converged Security and Management Engine nowadays, um, there is also technically uh, parsers available, but that's not really integrated in Fiatka yet. Um, but anyway, so if you uh, want to go and download this application, uh, you can try it out. And if you want to have some hints, uh, let's briefly look at this here. Now I'm on the GitHub page and in the Fiatka repository in the README, I actually gave a little example. I would just scroll down a bit here um, for trying it out. So here down under UFI, uh, there is a link here uh, for obtaining test images. You can download them from uh, RedRage. So that is a person who is publishing nightly builds of OVMF, the Open Virtual Machine Firmware. And uh, you can load that actually in Fiatka through the file picker and then just have a look at what's inside of there. And if you want, you can also just put a Linux boot image in there instead of having the UFI environment. So I want to give you a demo now how that works. And for that, I have already opened up Fiatka. This is now currently a development version, but you would uh, essentially have the same features. Um, you, you just see the emoji here and so on. That is uh, to uh, be released soon also. Um, and then there will also be uh, yeah some, some more parsing support for some minor details. It doesn't really matter right now. So let's go ahead and let's select a file. And from my downloads here, let's actually open this file here. It's called release x64 OVMF. So OVMF has builds for like different platforms. Uh, we go with x64. So that's the 64-bit 64, uh, 64 AMD platform and also Intel platforms. So yeah, when the analysis is done, you see the result here. So here on the left-hand side, you see the directories listed. You can shrink, uh, shrink them like this here by just clicking on it. And when you hover, you actually see on the right-hand side, there is a part highlighted. And that is the part that is covered by you know, this uh, directory here, if you will. So if you uh, think of like your file browser on your uh, you know, contemporary laptop, then you would have uh, something very similar. Uh, except here in the visualization, we also add some more metadata because it's not just uh, like files and sizes, but they also have like, you know, their specifics to them. In UFI, there is like a bunch of things you find, like PEI, for example. And this year, what we're looking at here, PEI core, uh, you, you can think of that like an operating systems kernel. And that is actually essentially what this year is. It's in like the early stage of UEFI called the pre-EFI initialization. So in UEFI, you have like, uh, you know, different phases. 
And while walking through those phases, you're like, uh, you know, jumping from one uh, little operating system like uh, environment to another. And well, yeah, that is just one of them. Anyway, so let's do the following here. Uh, let's quickly scroll down so that we can see uh, the output that we get. There is also this here. So Dixie core or also the Dixie phase, that is everything that is inside of here. Um, that is the next execution phase after PEI. Dixie is for driver execution environment. And well, as you can see, there is a bunch of stuff in here. And there is also some stuff that might not even be necessary. So uh, this is what we're going to use Yetka for now. We are going to remove things that we do not need from here. Um, for example, let's say, uh, I don't know, uh, let's say you don't really want to have networking support in here because you already have networking somewhere else in your stack. So you can remove all of this DHCP, FTP, and whatever. Um, and then let's uh, look further down here. Well, this here is just one file. Uh, well, this here is a firmware volume. So in UEFI file systems, there is some sort of nesting. And well, this here actually refers to a file, vo uh, like a f uh, another volume that is somewhere else. So this is just one file that is, you, you can think of it of like a directory tree, except that it's like, you know, so somewhat different. So yeah, when you click on that, you actually jump uh, up here, as you can see. So yeah, that was the directory defined from here. Um, clicking on those buttons up here actually jumps you very quickly to the respective section. So in UFI, everything is defined through GUIDs. And this here is just the first uh, four characters because otherwise it's just too long. Um, and as you can see down here is another section. This is called SEC. That is in uh, UFI terms like the first stage essentially. So they, they have the stages SEC, then comes PI, then comes Dixie, and then your operating system in a nutshell. Um, Right, so what we want to do here now is we want to remove a bunch of files from the Dixie environment, so from the driver execution environment. Sorry, the E is redundant in a way, but whatever. So what we're going to do is now, we're going to load a list that has files in it uh, that can be removed. So otherwise you could like click on individual files here by hitting the trash can icon here, like that is actually a button. If you click it, then you know it turns into a fire and it's marked for removal. But before we're going to do that, we actually need to look at something. And that goes like this. So first of all, I'm going to my downloads directory. And what I'm now going to do is I will show you that this here is indeed an OVMF image. How do I do that? I will run QMU and load the OVMF image using the BIOS parameter. So yeah, I already did this uh, a bunch of times when giving a demo, uh, but I've actually never recorded it. So we're doing that today. So this is what I'm running. I'm running QMU. I give it the machine Q35. That's actually also the default on x86. It's like, you know, a, a reference platform from like 1999. Um, I'm saying no graphic because I don't need the graphical output. And I say dash BIOS and I point that to the OVMF image. That is the file that I just downloaded like quite a while ago, but you know, it would be the same if you now downloaded a new one. So what happens when you run this? In QMU, you would now get the output, well, uh, from the Dixie. And uh, well, that environment runs this year in the last step. So BDS Dixie, BDS being short for boot device select, that is essentially the eventual loader that will then load your operating system or another bootloader, which could be like Grub, for example, or Shim, or whatever Microsoft's bootloader is called. I, I forgot that. Anyway, as you can see, it doesn't find any source to boot from. That is because, you know, we, we just have the firmware image. We haven't attached any drives or anything to it, right? So yeah, then it's trying to fall back to booting over Pixie. So Pixie is a network uh, boot environment over IPv4, whatever, it won't find anything there either. So yeah, we, we can just kill this process. I just control A and then X. That's how you exit QMU. All right, so next up, now we do the operation that I just described, right? So we're going to load a list of files. I have that here actually. Uh, I call it release x64 ovmf.removals.json. It's, it's really just a simple JSON file. I open it here, and now here on the right-hand side, you see a bunch of files listed. 
For example, Ramdisk Dixie, uh, DHCP4 Dixie, MTFTP Dixie, Setup Browser, ATI Bus Dixie, you know, all that stuff we don't really need. Um, and we can actually see if there is something else we don't really need. So if you look further down here now, first of all, you, you see the fire icons here. So fire icon uh, means removal. Um, let's see what else we don't really need actually. Well, um, I guess we can also remove the graphics console because we're not running graphics anyway, right? So I just hit the trash can icon there. Now we hit the apply button here on the right. And by doing that, we just apply all those removals here and then those files will be gone in a bit. So we click that button. Now we just need to wait a bit. Uh, yeah, this here is not yet uh, centered well, but you saw like, you know, a, a little spinner like thing, um, a, a shaking uh, flash chip there. Now the removals are applied, the uh, files are gone. And if you look here on the right hand side, there is actually a bunch more space now. So all the green space here, that is now new. It was a bit uh, more before, so I, I don't actually know because I hadn't paid attention. So as you can see, now we have 2.81 megabytes of free space. Uh, well, there is something wasted here in the front. So yeah, essentially we have like, I don't know, two and a half megabytes or something here. What do we do with those two and a half megabytes? We're going to do something that is called Linux boot. So let's uh, click the hand icon here uh, that is pointing up. So that is how you can always jump to the top. Now we say, instead of selecting a file, now we say Linux boot. And when we say Linux boot, we can load an image, uh, which is, well, essentially it could be any EFI application, but what we're going to load now is something that I already prepared. It's a Linux kernel with a built-in initram file system and in that initrom file system, we have a small environment, which is coming from the uroot project. That is also sort of under the umbrella of the Linux boot project. So in there we have like, you know, some basic commands like ls and cat and so on. So we do that. Uh, we hit Linux boot and we are going to load something from, well, I already prepared this here. Uh, this file, it's called mini LB. And as you can see, it's two and a half megabytes in size. So it's like, just about to fit, right? So I say open, now it's saying reassembling. We see some shaking gears here. And when that operation is done, we're just going to self, uh, uh, save the resulting file. Now, when we click the save icon here, we get a file picker again. So I'm suggesting to call uh, the file just, you know, whatever you had first and then dot .mod at the end. That would just, you know, for the sake of the example here, uh, I, I will go and call it something else. So, you know, that you can really be sure that I'm not making anything up here. Uh, so let's call it, I don't know, uh, dot whatever uh, live demo, okay? So now I have this file in my home directory and what we're now going to do is we're going to load the modified file, uh, which was called something live demo. And to be really sure I'm not making this up, uh, let's list the file. Uh, we can see I just created the file. It's uh, quarter to nine. Um, that is PM here in uh, Europe currently. So let's uh, QMU blah de blah dot live demo. And what should happen now is instead of the output that we saw from UFI, instead of BDS Dixie, whatever, instead we should see a Linux kernel booting up. And lo and behold, you see output from Linux and Linux is up and running, we're in a Linux shell, right? So we can now say like, I don't know, cat proc CPU info. And now you see, well, this is saying authentic AMD, QMU, virtual CPU, whatever, right? So there we go. Now we have a Linux environment. And what do we do with this? Well, the interesting part here is now you are in full control of your bootloader environment. That means, first of all, you can implement your own boot protocols if you so want it. Like, let's say you want to boot from a network and instead of using Pixie, you actually want to use something like HTTP, for example, right? Or, well, actually HTTPS because let's say you are a hyperscaler and you have set up your own environment with your own network images and so on. And, you know, you have your own trust chain and everything. So you want to be in full control of everything. You don't want like lots of, uh, you know, external parties that you depend on, but you actually want to be mostly self-sufficient, right? So what you do buy is the hardware from other parties, but, you know, you want to provide the platform then 
from like your own uh, inventory, right? Okay, so much for the demo. Um, do we have shutdown here? No, I think we have like power off. No, we don't. Actually, we just hit control A and X again. Anyway, this is really just for the sake of the demo. It's, it's really just a tiny environment. If you were to roll this out in like your own infrastructure on your own premise, you know, you would actually um, do a bit more of a like a fine grained uh, search through your file system and, you know, see what other files you can remove and so on. And for that, we have automated tuning uh, tools in uh, Fiano. There is a tool called UTK, the UFI toolkit. And that is the command line tool doing essentially exactly the same that Fiatka is also doing because Fiatka really is using Fiano as its backend. All right, so much for the demo. Um, there is a few other things we can actually look at here and I want to briefly show you around. So one of them is there is a feedback button here where you get analysis feedback. It will tell you like if there is something not found. So like AMD, for example, the AMD from a parser couldn't actually find anything in here and so couldn't uh, CBFS, so that would be the core boot file system. Because this is not like a core boot or uh, AMD image. It's really just a generic UFI something. So yeah, nothing uh, other specific stuff here. Uh, we have this button called outline. It's currently just printing null. Um, this would need some, uh, also, you know, some more work. So currently uh, this is really just made for AMD based images. And so you would get some more output. Um, there is an export button where you can export the whole state of what you see here, like essentially the analysis result as a large JSON file. That is currently not really well defined. Like, you know, it's really very experimental, uh, but you can already uh, use it. And, you know, for the, for example, if you uh, wanted to look at um, different images from like different platforms, for example, or I don't know, compare uh, two machines essentially uh, running the same, but maybe slightly different variants uh, of some firmware. You know, you could also look at the differences and stuff. Um, but yeah, more uh, more is uh, planned for you know some point later, but not at this stage. Um, you can ignore this button called faucet. Uh, there is something I also have in mind for Fiatka at some point where you know you would also be able to actually emulate some of the binaries that you see in here. That would be a really awesome feature, but uh, frankly, it needs some more work, right? So what I want to be able to do is like, I want to be able to, uh, you know, click some of these drops here, you know, uh, then put everything in a sync in a way, uh, turn on the faucet, and that is how you run your emulation environment. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit of a stupid wordplay. Anyway, um, yeah, that is a feature for, you know, some somewhere, I don't know, maybe in a few years or something. Um, so what else? Let's do the following. Let's select a different file now. And the other file I want to look at now is an image I got from an AMD system. Uh, and that would be that one here. So that we can also see some richer output. So what you just saw was really just the UFI part of some former image. And now let's have a look what happens if you also have something from, let's say, AMD platform security processor. So yeah, the analysis takes a while. Uh, the larger the file is, the longer it takes, unfortunately. Um, there is probably potential for optimization, but yeah, let's ignore that for now. Um, in the current upstream version, also, let me just warn you, there is no full support yet for AMD, but at least some support, and I'm working on much, much more. Um, what we're going to see here now may already hold, uh, well, a bit, a bit more than <laughs> you would currently see with some minor errors, but yeah, let's ignore that fact for now. Uh, let's really just see what we get out of it. Um, yeah, it should be done any second, actually. Uh, you, you always see shaking gears here, right? We already got output down here and here we go. So yeah, we see the UFI part again here. So yeah, we have this sort of like directories again. Um, with a bunch of stuff down here. Again, on the right hand side, you can see, you know, what is covered by this part. Uh, you can also search for something like, I don't know, if you want to see if there is an email client in your firmware, for example, you can type like SMTP, for example. Um, this here is what ASRock is doing, for example, they have a, uh, an email client in the firmware. So, I don't know, it's for customer support, they told me. Um, quite interesting. Anyway, let's clear that right away and let's look at the AMD side. 
So here again, we also have something like directories. You can also open and shrink them. Um, but here we already have some uh, more interesting metadata. For example, you see the key emoji. Well, that is for the public keys here. So there is like some AMD public key, some, I don't know, debugging public key and stuff like that. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, yeah, let's actually shrink this a bit. Um, so up here, these are actually the so-called PSP directories. So that is like with um, you know, firmware bits and pieces meant for the platform security processor. And down here now we have the so-called BIOS directories. And those are for the x86 processor. I'm putting a boot emoji wherever we have bootable firmware. Um, I'm not exactly sure about that one. Uh, that should probably not have a boot emoji, but I'm not too sure yet. This year, definitely. So this year is for you know the BIOS part. Um, well, except that it's not really a BIOS today. That just call it BIOS um, anyway. So you can also click on things here to mark them uh, for longer time. Anyway, so this whole thing here uh, is loaded as one image for uh, the x86 processor for execution. And uh, if you want to see some more metadata, let's uh, uh, expand this again. Um, what do we have here? So we also print the size uh, if the binary is signed or, I don't know, compressed and packed and stuff like that. Um, that is some, some more metadata that you can also get from the uh, PSP uh, file system. Anyway, so yeah, um, putting that aside again, uh, let's jump back up here and look at the outline feature now. So now here in the outline, well, you, you see some minor details, as I'm saying. So it's, uh, you know, <laughs> really just a dumb print currently. Nothing too exciting, um, but well, you can uh, see like the high level data structure here. So in the AMD firmware image, you know, you have something um, that is called the uh, like an, uh, em embedded, uh, embedded something structure. Um, so that would be like, you know, like the, the first level, essentially your entry point in a way. And then further down, uh, you have some extra information like uh, I don't know, IMC firmware, uh, GBE firmware. I'm actually not sure what IMC is. GBE would be like gigabit ethernet. As you can see, those are both not included here, but here we have XHCI. So that would be like for uh, USB. Um, I guess you would need to uh, remove the FF here. So in uh, like uh, in the real system, that would be like memory map to uh, this address, but if you want to read within the file, you would just, you know, look at those six digits here. Um, what else do we have? So the PSP directories, that is essentially what you see here also, like at these two addresses, and then there is BIOS directories for, well, uh, three different um, uh, family ranges. Uh, however, here, uh, what do we see? We actually see seven entries here. And why is that? Well, this year is actually not even complete. It was, it's really just from a current draft, which is, uh, well, um, just a first iteration. So what feedback do we get? Well, from core boot, we, we see that we cannot get the FMAP signature. So FMAP would be like flash map. Um, that is what core boot is using for its file system. Okay. So, Speaking of core boot, let's actually do this uh, last time and see if we can, uh, you know, parse the uh, firmware from my laptop here. And this laptop is actually running core boot. So uh, let's look at firmware and uh, system 76. So this is a Lumo Pro and the firmware image is here, firmware.rom. And there we go. Now we have a core boot file system. And in core boot, we actually have a, a small and simple file system. Um, there are some things where it just says no name here and it says deleted to. It's not too meaningful. It actually really just means some empty space. Um, so here we essentially just have like the address, the size and a compression flag. Uh, there is something that is compressed like this year, for example, the RAM stage, it's uh, LZMA compressed. So yeah, maybe we can also mark that with emoji or something. I don't know, maybe a package emoji or whatever. I'm not sure yet. Um, anyway, let's also shrink this. And now let's look here on the right hand side what this covers. So there is something called the CBFS master header. 
And that is what we find here. So this here is where the CVFS file system starts. So yeah, FS already being short for file system. So in Core Boot, we have these stages called the ROM stage. There is a RAM stage. Uh, there is configuration here, a revision. Um, now this year, DSDT AML, that is something uh, coming from ACPI. So in ACPI, there is, you know, lots of tables and this is one of the tables. Uh, the T in, uh, you know, all those table acronyms is usually for table. Like there is, I don't know, MADT, DSDT and whatnot. And AML is just the ACP, um, I don't know, machine language, I think. So yeah. Um, the operating system will need an interpreter for running uh, the stuff in here. So if you see Linux booting up, sometimes, you know, you see messages around ACPI. Anyway, yeah, these are all the faults in here. Um, the last one is called boot block. And let's see down here. It's actually a very small chunk. It's uh, this year. Um, and what is boot block? If, if you look at this year, you know, it's, it's really just the few early uh, instructions that are being run. As you can see, this here is actually not really much. It would then at some point just jump up here and continue with the ROM stage. So in Core Boot, similar to UFI, you have multiple stages. So you have the boot block, you have the ROM stage, you have the RAM stage, well, and then you hand over to your payload. And that would be here, right? So yeah. Uh, well, there is also this stage called post car. So car is short for cache as RAM. And well, that is a concept from when you do the uh, memory initialization, like the DRAM, the, that's the RAM we're talking about here. Um, then, then you would get into this stage, I think. I'm not too sure actually, because I'm not, you know, working on x86 very much these days or, uh, well, core boot for that matter. So I'm, I'm, I'm not too versed in this year. Um, but what else can we see here? Well, we have this year, we have SS, FSPM, that is something coming from Intel. FSP is the firmware support package and M is for memory. So this is for memory initialization. Then there is FSPS and I think the S is for silicon. That is like for, you know, the SLC initialization. Um, there is this year VBT, I think is video BIOS table, something. SPD is like, I don't know, something product data, I forgot. Um, or single, oh no, that could actually be serial presence detect but I wouldn't know why this would be a binary file. I don't know. Well, serial presence detect is something in like a DRAM where, you know, if you have like um, a DRAM module, you know, there would be like a, a small flash chip on there and you would actually detect that over like usually a I squared C or something like I squared C. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's what this refers to, but I'm not too sure at this point. Maybe somebody can correct me if you know. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, that was a very brief explanation here. Now, if we look at outline, well, still we get null. And well, if we look at feedback, well, we'll say um, for you, if I had actually says an invalid FV length, so this here couldn't parse the UFI bits of this uh, image. Um, and that is, well, because in, in, in this instance here, uh, what is happening is, uh, you know, after core boot, they would hand over to UFI and the UFI payload is, I guess, sort of compressed. And I guess, uh, you know, our parser is currently not uh, capable of recognizing that properly. I mean, if you just look at this uh, size here, it doesn't even make sense. So some something must be wrong here. I mean, we, we, can, uh, we can try to read this uh, number. It is like, I don't know, uh, this here is millions. Uh, billions, uh, trillions, you get the idea. Uh, it's like point, like a point two quintillion uh, bytes that doesn't make sense in any way, shape or form. That is definitely not the size of the data in here. Um, so yeah, there, there, there is something weird. Uh, it says uh, the form of volume length is greater than the data length. And well, that is like, I don't know, nine megabytes. I mean, which, which is, to be fair, already quite a lot, but yeah, whatever. Anyway, um, yeah, that is uh, the FiatCard tool. And uh, I want to invite you to also join uh, later streams here where, you know, we will also develop some more uh, for the FiatCard environment. So if you haven't yet noticed, uh, FiatCard is running as a desktop application and it's 
based on something called Electron. And Electron is essentially just a Chromium browser, uh, but you can use it as a standalone runtime environment for an application. So you can just write your application in JavaScript. You can have your, you know, just HTML markdown, you know, uh, for like a, a small base. And then, you know, you would just use the JavaScript runtime to essentially render all the widgets and stuff. And then for the analysis part or also manipulation, we just call into a backend that is written in Go, but it's running also in the context of the built-in uh, Chromium browser here. And that is through something called WebAssembly. And WebAssembly is essentially like a byte interpreter uh, machine, so to say, that is just running, uh, you know, in, in a second context in the browser. So uh, typically you would have like a JavaScript engine and then also a WebAssembly engine. So, well, you, you have two runtimes uh, that you can work with. And the nice thing about WebAssembly is you can easily target that with Go. You can target that with Rust and also with C or C++ if you so want it. Well, here in our uh, case, it's Go. So hence, uh, you know, our uh, good friend, the Gopher down there, uh, the Go language mascot. Anyway, um, yeah, I'm also uh, thinking of adding some code that is written in Rust to uh, Fiatka at some point. Uh, it's, well, not yet in place or set up. If you have something interesting that you think you could add here, uh, feel very free and welcome to add the support. I'm always happy about pull requests and uh, well, for now, uh, let's end this session here and I will see you in another one. Until then, take care and goodbye.